You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Ryan Teos is here. Hi. Hi, Ryan. Hello. It's good to see you. Good to see you. You look too. Uh, like you. Uh, your hair's growing. It is growing. A little bearded. Look like a um, Josh Brolin's dad. Uh, James Brolin. James Brolin. James Brolin. But a younger James Brolin. A younger James. Real Brolin. handsome young Amityville horror James Brolin. <laughs> I'll take it. Anybody seen that movie? I will take it. I loved it. Uh, hey, I hope you're enjoying your week. Uh, thank you for spending an hour with us. Um, means a lot. If you like the interview today or you don't like it, I ask you to subscribe. <laughs> uh, write a review. It really, truly helps the podcast. And uh, it means a lot. It means a lot. There's so many competitors, so many people out there. And you know we want to keep doing this show. And also, you can join Patreon if you really want to help the podcast. That's Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash inside of you. People give back to the podcast. It's also a huge community, and a lot of people become friends. It's really amazing. Check it out. There's different tiers where I send you boxes and prizes and all sorts of shit. And we have YouTube lives and uh, Zooms, and it, it's just everything. Go to Patreon dot com slash inside of you and support the podcast if you will. And uh, you could also go to the Inside of You online store. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Inside yeah, you online yeah. store, you can get uh, small of a lunchbox, uh, uh, a Lexmas autograph script from me. What about something like that that you're wearing right now? Uh, you can you get that? No, that you can't get this sweatshirt anymore. Show a little zippy thing and show a show little chest hair. Can I do that? A little right bit. Of, oh, oh, damn. Oh, it's, it's getting too sexy. Oh, sorry. Too I'm sexy. Too sexy for my inside of you jacket. <laughs> Um, but you can get a lot of great stuff there inside of you stuff and I uh, appreciate it. And you can also go to sunspin.com. That's the name of the band sunspin. And you can get a bunch of merch there and book zooms with me and Rob. It's always a blast. We just zoomed with Leanne and Michelle. That was a fun time. All right. Also, uh, if you like the show, follow us, you can follow us on, uh, t- tell them about it, Ryan. Uh, at inside of you pod on Twitter, at inside of you podcast on Facebook. <laughs> you know, you know where to go. Facebook, you guys Instagram. know where to go, right? It's right. Facebook and Instagram. Uh, it it means bad. a lot. So support the podcast, and uh, it takes a second to go follow us and write a review and subscribe. Well, you can do all of it really quickly. So uh, today's guest, Chris Diamantopoulos. Now, listen, I, if you don't know him, you're going to thoroughly enjoy this interview. I love this interview. This guy. Floored us with impressions. Floored us with impressions. My God. Uh, the Three Stooges. Uh, Robin Williams' impression. He, he was in The Three Stooges, and that story of, of how they treated him oh, yeah. was astonishing. Yeah. I can't wait for you to hear that. They didn't pay the guy a cent. Uh, he's the voice of Mickey Mouse. He's in Red Notice on Netflix. The guy's blowing up. He's a super talent. I loved having him on the podcast. If you don't know him, have a listen. Let's get inside of Chris Diamantopoulos. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Actually, this is really nice. It's a nice setup. You like the setup? I have a, a home studio too, and, and I, I put uh, a tremendous amount of time and, and effort into it, particularly you know once we realized we were in all this. Uh, and, and, um, this COVID thing, this COVID thing, it was gratifying to do, but I have to say, I think, I think what you've done here, see, I, <laughs> I focused a great deal of time on the technical aspects being, you know, the, the because I've recorded so many, uh, I have to, rec- I'm recording so many series from in there. Right. I wanted it to be sort of. So you're recording, like you do a lot of animation and you're doing all the animation from your own home studio. All of it. Yeah. Yeah. I did a whole se- a season of uh, wonderful world of Mickey mouse there. And, and you play the voice of Mickey mouse. Well, hot dog, I sure do. Yeah. And you auditioned for that, of course. I did, and I actually passed on the audition. I got the audition right after I had done the three Sto- the Fairly Brothers th- Three Stooges movie. Well, I tested for that. Did for you Mo? Really? Oh, dude, They're you, the one you got. You would have been great. But you look like you could be a Mo. You got the eyebrows. You do, got the. You know, I I I am a lifelong Stooge fan. As a matter of fact, the first public speaking engagement I ever did when I was in grade six in Toronto. We were supposed to do a speech, 20 minute speech. Each kid was supposed to do one at the end of the year. Right. The kids did like Everglades or volcanoes. To, I did Mo Howard. Uh, and it, it's been my Can life. Can you jump long. into Mo Howard anytime? What are you complaining about? What are you talking about here? You know, I, dude, I mean, for me, <laughs> Mo was, uh, Mo was, oh my God, Mo, WUTV I, Buffalo 29. That was Mo. Um, I love actors 
Ryan. Ryan, the engineer here. Ryan's yes. my main man. My main man thinking then. I love when actors can do impressions. I've always done impressions, and sometimes you bring an actor on here, and they go, "No, I don't. I don't do impressions." But you come, you come in here. The first thing you see no, but you is see, Indiana Jones. Come on, and baby. you start doing the crusade. Just do give me a little piece of the okay, crusade. Okay, it's um, last well, crusade. It wasn't always shared. You're, you're, you're old enough to be her, her grandfather. Well, I'm as human as the next man. I was the next man. <laughs> Ships that pass in the night. Remember the last time we had a quiet drink? Huh? What are you talking about? We never talked. It's a lonely way to grow up, Dad. If you'd been an ordinary average guy like the other guy's fathers, you'd have understood that. Actually, I was a wonderful father. When? <laughs> Did I ever tell you to clean up, go to bed, wash your ears, do your homework? No. I respected your privacy and I taught you self-reliance. All right, we'll stop there. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the amazing thing is that that's all that's in there. And I think it'll be a quick transition between this and senility. Uh, you know, it <laughs> you should think so? Be, well, I think so. I think it'll be pretty seamless. I'll just drift off into that beautiful little, you know, magical uh, memory. It's, uh, there's like, like, you know, a good 15, 16 movies that are just locked in there and I'll just live in there. What are some other movies that are locked in there? Oh man. Well, the court jester, Danny Kay, the court jester. That's, that's the first one that was ever locked in there. If you haven't seen it. No, no. So you should. Uh, 1955. Danny fucking Kay though. Dancer, right? So he was, Danny Kay was everything. As a matter of fact, at his height, Danny Kay was the top movie star, TV star, radio star, and Broadway star. Wow. He was he was uh, tremendously facile with his mouth and he did these amazing uh, tongue twister songs and scenes that actually his wife, Sylvia Fine, was, was the author of most of them. Right. You ever heard the pellet with the poisons and the vessel with the pestle, the child's from the palace is a brew that is true? Oh, he's, he's just, he's just this, he was, he was everything. For right. me, when I was nine years old and I saw the court jester, that was it. So first it was the Stooges, right? The Stooges was, that, that, that was my life. So you memorized all that stuff. There was, so uh, WUTV Buffalo 29 had like a good, I want to say they had like 40 or 50 Stooge shorts that they would air in syndication. Now you're watching this in Toronto. Yep, in Toronto. In Toronto, you're getting this station, Buffalo 29, and yep. that's where you're watching all this stuff that yep. gets just lodged into the brain. As a matter of fact, it's it's WUTV Buffalo 29 that's the reason that I don't have a Canadian accent because I learned, I'm, I'm Greek, and my first yeah. language was Greek at home, but I learned how to speak English watching my favorite American actors. So I never developed a Canadian accent because I wanted to sound just like Harrison Do your Ford. friends, just, do your oh, yeah. friends have Canadian accents? Absolutely. Like how do they talk? Well, so most of my friends in Toronto, many of my friends in Toronto are Greek Canadians. So they would, uh, they'd say, look, I'm sorry, but I grew up in Toronto. So, you know, this is how I, how I talk, you know? So, <laughs> it, you know, it's okay. Sorry. And, and, yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're not, you're not cool with that. Um, yeah, no, but it was really, I, 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 I was imitate, fully imitating, uh, uh, the American accent. Wow. And so, and it, and it, I guess it, it boded well, but yes, uh, memorized uh, too many. Jerry Maguire is one that's in there for some reason. That's a great Jerry movie, man. Maguire. Oh, man. Okay. Jerry. You got to give it because people like this. We don't get a lot of people that do impressions. And I feel like I'm already always reiterating or spitting out old impressions that I do. <laughs> uh -huh. So people, I'm sure they would like to hear some of this. So give me a little Jerry Maguire. Oh my God. Jerry Maguire. It's, it's just such a great, uh, <laughs> I, uh, let, let's, let's give you a little, I, I love, um, I love when he says, um, you see this coat? Well, I don't need it. You can have it because I am cloaked in failure. I love cloaked in failure is, is, is a, a line that I've used. Anytime my wife, I'm walking out of an audition she's like, how'd it go? Well, it's either, you know, great or, or cloaked, cloaked in, in failure. failure. Yes, yes, yes. No, the, the other one that comes from that is, it is an up at dawn pride swallowing siege that I will never be able to fully tell you about. Okay, Rod? <laughs> up at dawn, pride swallowing siege. Those are, oh, that's, that's also amazing. a good audition story. I do a very, you know, the obscure ones like, like? oh, oh, wait, 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 was she a great big fat person? Oh. Put the lotion in the basket or it gets the hose again. Don't you hurt my precious lady. You don't know what pain is. You know, stuff like that. Dude, that's phenomenal. Lawrence Turney. Here are your names. Mr. Blue, Mr. Brown, Mr. Pink. What am I going to be Mr. Pink for? Because you're a... Well, well, I can't say it. <laughs> yeah, you can't say it. Can't say it. That's but very I, good. But I, I never left the house. I close my eyes and I'm there. That's I never good. left the house. I would uh, always do... Isn't Mr. Brown a little close to Mr. Shit? That's your name. You... 
I, I, I just, I, I wouldn't leave that. I'd get so enamored by movies totally. that I would just, you know, I'd get lost. I think that was a way to escape for me as a kid. Braveheart, I think. Braveheart was a big one for me too. Braveheart. I just recently watched Braveheart for the first time. Yes. Does it hold up? It does. It, yeah. was, it was really fun. The trouble with Scotland is that it's full of Scots. Perhaps it's time to reinstitute an old custom. Grant them prima nocta. First night. I mean, it's really fucking. I'm sorry. We were not allowed to swear on this. Yeah, show. you can swear. Oh, oh, okay. yes, oh God, yes, guys, you can swear. When you really stop and think about, oh, it's most that, of my guests don't. They don't. No, no, I'm no, kidding. No, I'm kidding. Okay, no, they do. They do. People, <laughs> people swear. Ryan, you swear. Oh gosh. Oh, there you go. Ryan. In fact, Ryan, Ryan was just quoting you. He was like, oh, dude, he's from Silicon Valley. Yes. Oh, yeah, and yes. I go, oh, yes. And the first thing I say, well, what do you know about Silicon Valley? And what did you say, Ryan? Oh, it's this guy fucks. There it is. That's it. And I, you know it's what's funny? So I looked at horrible. Ryan because I walked in here and I looked at you and no no, no, no disrespect, but I think Ryan's the guy in the house doing all the fucking. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan is doing all the fucking. But what a classic line. You have people come up to you and say, oh, my God. Yes, so much. I mean, in New- <laughs> this when guy I fucks. In- is that I, what it is? It's yeah. this guy fucks. When I lived in New York City, it's when I really realized, oh my gosh, yeah, that there th- that character and that particular Russ episode, Hanneman, Russ Hanneman resonated so much with this sort of eighteen to fifty five year old, you know, startup VC bro demographic. And it, it's listen, I, I think it's I think it's lovely when when you as an actor do something that resonates with with the fan base. I, it, it's it's gratifying. Yes. It's challenging when I'm walking my six year old daughter and someone's like, "Hey, this guy fucks," and she's like, "What do you say, Daddy?" I'm like, "He said this guy's a fox," <laughs> and she's like, "That's equally weird, Dad. <laughs> equally weird. Equally weird. Yeah." But that's cool though when people recognize you and say, "Oh so, my god, it's a signature." Yeah, you know, there's a signature line, and it and and you know, look, I have, I'm so, I'm so lucky. I have I've only ever acted in my life. I've never held another job. Really, I, I since start, you were like nine, nine, right? Yeah, I did I did, did, did commercials and and uh, and your parents were all for this. So my folks, and I do have to fucking give it to my parents, man, because my parents are lovely educated traditional greeks mm. they they don't have a concept of you know sort of like they're not stage parents they they didn't understand any of it what they did fully recognize almost before i did was that i had a keen desire to entertain and and they knew that they had to do something about that. Well, what what was that? Were you were you doing impressions like you were for me just now? Yeah. yeah. Or you always what were you doing? That yeah. Made them I, think that I was doing. I, I, when we would go to Greece in the summers, we didn't have a TV, where, where, and and my parents would just have me reenact uh, Stooges shorts, you know, uh, and and it was it was just they saw that it was more than just me messing around. They actually saw that there was skill there, and uh, and I remember my mom signed me up for this <laughs> improv class. That was just this, it was this Saturday afternoon thing that she'd read about in the paper. And I ended up getting an agent from that and, and started to do commercials. And that was, it was a fun little, I had like a little moment, like when nine to 11, I actually did a lot of local commercials in Toronto. And then, and then when people were recognizing you, it really started happening. Hey, you're the Rice Krispies guy. Hey, you're the Honda commercial guy. Oh, you know, wow. it was a little thing. It was, it was sweet. Yeah. But then uh, puberty slapped me in the face like a fucking sledgehammer. And, and overnight I went from like precocious, attractive commercial kid to oh my god what happened to you man oh uh, <laughs> awkward just as awkward as could be my my I, my one of my headshots from that era my brother describes as the shaken awake sprayed in the face with crisco and hair lit on fire uh that's that's what i <laughs> now i want to see a picture yeah, i gotta find now it. i gotta see it's a picture one small eye one big <laughs> one big eye uh and it was really really bad but that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me realize that Okay, so the, the, I'm not going to be remembered for my looks. It's got to be something else. And, right. and, and I started really a, a deep dive into, and that's where Danny Kay came into play because it, his was his was a facility with language and with music and with, as you said, with with dance and song. And and so I, I started really getting into musicals and really started getting into stage performance and and uh, and I, I I went into it with great aplomb. I really wanted to be like Bing Crosby or Gene Kelly. Well, it's funny because you played Sinatra in the Kennedys. That's true. I did. I and did. I did so play Sinatra. The you, you have a knack for that kind of old school feel. Is that is that what you're saying? I, I love that vernacular. That era. I think, yeah, 30s, 40s, 50s, that 60s. sweetheart kind of thing. I, there's something about the way that they spoke, the cadence. There was a music, musicality to it. There was a romance to it. I had the the distinct pleasure of doing a a, a, a such an odd project that was just so beautiful 
because it was a singular opportunity. I did one of these uh, televised live musicals. I did the Christmas Ooh, Story live for that Fox. That scares the shit out of me. Oh, it's the, listen, I'm a Broadway veteran, right? I I, I did eight shows a week for 15 years. Right. And that's- Full Monty. I, and... did, I did Les Miserables. I did the Full Monty. I did uh, Waitress. Uh, right. Uh, but, but I'll tell you, that Christmas Story live was the most harrowing and exhilarating experience, uh, performance experience I've ever done. Because- Who'd you play? I played the old man. I played old man Parker. Oh, great. It, which was, and you know, when Scott- uh, yeah, Yes, exactly. Right. When, when, uh, when Scott Ellis called me about it, I was like, really? I'm, I'm not, I don't, th- I think I'm like 20 years too young, dude. And he said, no, 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 it's a, it's a musical. It's not, we're not redoing the movie. We're redoing the Broadway musical. And I didn't know that they had done a musical. And, and when I, when I sort of looked at it, he said, you know, you've got to, you got to be able to sing and dance. And, 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 and I thought about it and I was like, I love Scott Ellis. I think he's a brilliant director. And I'd worked with Maya. Uh, Maya Rudolph and I had done up right. all night together. I'm in love with her. I think she's just you played the greatest. her on again, off again boyfriend. Right? <laughs> I did. I played uh, and I created that guy. They were like, we we don't know what this guy we, we want this guy to be, and we made him my Armenian tailor. He <laughs> was this guy. Ava, don't call me my friend, my friend. He, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the guy who had a, a beautiful bathroom with a jacuzzi tub. Yeah, um, but, but you had to sing. I mean, are you a good singer? I am a good singer. You're I, a good singer. I'm a good singer. I, you know, I spent, listen, I spent years and years and years on Broadway honing my voice. So yeah, it turns out that I, uh, I, I can sing. Inside of You is brought to you by my good friends at BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy is uh, somebody, uh, a company that's been with me for a while now. And um, if you listen to the podcast, you understand why. They're really helping people. They're helping people like my friend Ryan here. Ryan, you still go to BetterHelp? I still go to BetterHelp. And how much is it helping you? It is helping immensely. Yeah. A lot of my friends are like, is this, is this real, the real deal? Is BetterHelp? I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. man. It's, uh, a lot of people are using it and really liking it. I get letters all the time sent to me that say, hey, thanks for you know your BetterHelp uh, sponsor because they're really helping me. Yeah. And you know you definitely save a lot more than going to you know just getting in your car and going somewhere. Um you know, those therapy sessions are expensive as hell. Yeah. And BetterHelp is definitely a lot cheaper. Uh, you know, many people think that therapy is for uh, other people. But utilizing therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you recognize that all humans have emotions and we need to learn to understand them, not avoid them. And we've been taught um, that taking care of our mental health shouldn't be a part of everyday life. But that's a huge misconception. We take care of our bodies by exercising, going to the doctor, eating well, focusing on and investing in the health of our minds is just as important. Um, BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Ryan, do you see them on camera? I do. You like that? I like it. I think it helps for me. It helps for you. You like to see the person. It's more of some contact, some uh, interaction. It just feels... Hey, you just see some kind, empathetic faces across from you. No, I like that. Yeah. No. Uh, like I said, it's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you could be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Look, give it a try. So many people have tried this. Two million people have been using BetterHelp online therapy. And inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash inside. That's right. 10% off for inside of you listeners off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash inside. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Inside of you is brought to you by Creatures of Habit. That's with a K, Ryan. No. Creatures of Habit is an in-your-face lifestyle and wellness brand rooted in delivering nutritional, healthy habits alongside cozy apparel. The founder's story is one of hope, change, adversity, and now success. Michael Chernow made a decision 17 years ago to change his life from struggling with addiction and mental health to living a life of wellness. It wasn't as easy as it sounds, but the choice to find a few healthy habits to commit first thing in the morning was his gateway into a better way of living. One of those habits was oatmeal. Mm. That's right. And he stuck with it as his first meal of the day for all these years. When he launched KOH, he set out to develop the most delicious and healthy first meal of the day that included oats, of course, but he added protein and daily supplements so that he could help people get everything essential our body needed all in one product. Meet the Prote. 
protagonist. Get that? Uh, like oat? It's like an oat. In the middle? Protagonist? Uh, I see. An incredibly delicious, highly optimized superhuman oatmeal packed with 30 grams of plant-based protein, vitamin D3, omega-3 fatty acids, probiotic, and digestive enzymes. This is not just oatmeal. The protagonist is your daily wellness insurance designed and created for convenience. Whether you're running out the door or like to prep the night before, the protagonist comes in a four easy to whip up recipes. You just add water overnight in the fridge, in the microwave, or into a smoothie. And because we want you operating at your absolute best, in addition to being plant-based, the protagonist is also gluten-free, soy and dairy-free, non-GMO and allergen-free. You can take it on the road when you're traveling, on a camping trip, in your bag to work or the gym, and start every day with all the energy living requires. Yeah, look at this. I got the box right here. This is the chocolate. We've got vanilla. We've got uh, other flavors, too. It's delicious. You just add hot water. It's so simple, and uh, you're going to love this stuff. Hop over to CreaturesOfHabit.com. That's Creatures with a K. CreaturesOfHabit.com, and use promo code INSIDE15. That's INSIDE15 to get 15% off your first purchase creaturesofhabit.com with a K and use promo code inside 15 for 15% off your first order. Remember, we are a direct outcome of our daily habits. Some habits will break you. Some will make you. Creatures of Habit is here to support you on the journey of making greatness a bigger part of your life. What do you sing when you're alone in, your, in the shower? That's not musical theater. Oh, what is it? Is it? Do you like like I love yacht rock? I love Chicago. Oh, I love Foreigner. Sure, I love the eighties. I love Depeche Mode. I, I mean, I love the. I sing a lot of George Michael, dude. What do you sing? Time can never mend. See that the the tonality. The careless whispers of, of a, a good, good friend. friend. To the heart and mind, mind. Ding, 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 ding. ignorance is kind. There's, There's no comfort, comfort in the Yeah, truth. yeah, totally, dude. Wow. You know, I have a friend who has a theory that the late, great George Michael may have sold his soul to the devil. How so? And, oh, it's, it's fascinating. Apparently, there's no record of George Michael ever taking any uh, instrumental or musical lesson ever. And yet, his first produced albums, he is... He was the instrumentalist. He did he did vocals, trumpet, keyboards, guitar, and out of nowhere, from like literally, there's no and record. no one has records of him playing any instruments. He was never even in the school choir, and out of nowhere, he's got this angelic, perfectly melodic, fully understood, resonant voice. And uh, yeah, she seems to think that he sold. The soul I've to always the devil. thought that. I've always looked at some people's careers and people who make exorbitant amounts of money and think they sold their soul to the devil. Something must they, be going they on. They did something. There's something. There's something there. There's something. I really believe, I, I mean, I hate to say I really believe it because it makes you sound like a crazy person, <laughs> but it's just like, it's, it's just it's just too insane sometimes to think somebody could be either that good yeah. or, yeah. you know. And pa it, it's the Paganini, the Paganini myth, right? You, you heard of Paganini? Uh, he was a violinist that was so gifted in his time that it wasn't a rumor. It was a firm belief in the social construct that this man sold his soul the devil that's how well he played wow i love that idea yeah yeah i like neat. it too yeah. it's like that whole uh, uh what is it the 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 charlie daniels yeah band. yeah yeah, yeah. Devil went down to georgia oh, looking for dude. a soul to steal he was in a bind he was way behind he was looking to make a deal looking to make a deal yeah. what was that what was that with the, the give the devil his due i bet a fiddle of gold against your soul because i think i'm better than you the boy said my name's johnny and it might be a sin but i'll take your bet you're gonna regret i'm the best it's ever been that's but it. Anyway, that's it, man. So that's did, it. Did, did your, but you trained. So as a, you didn't sell your you soul to the devil. No. Your parents so, threw you in improv. They threw you in class. So, they threw you. Here's the deal. I, I'll say this. There, I have, I have like isolated moments. I did, I did Saturday morning improv class for nine weeks when I was nine. That was a improv big, at nine. But there was a really big, the, I, I mean, I still use elements from that. I mean, I always remember never to say no, right? In a scene. And if someone's, if someone goes off, you just, as long as you don't right. say no, the scene can carry on. Yes. That's still like one of the best lessons I've ever gotten. And then there was a brief- By the way, what mm -hmm. he's saying is, if you don't know, because we just skimmed over that. Yes. In other words, if you're doing a scene and you're improvising and some guy goes, we are going to the hospital. You don't say no or not. We're <laughs> right. going to the amusement park. <laughs> right. you, you go can, with your, you, you, you listen and you go with you the gotta direction. You got to go with it. Yeah. You got to go with it. Yes. So it's 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 a it's a bad thing if you if you Correct. change direction. Correct. And and as I said, after when puberty hit and I started realizing I had to sort of figure out what else I was good at, I was I was on a deep dive of I was a big um, 
medieval history and and sword and sandals movie buff. So uh, <laughs> the, the court jester led me to all the Errol Flynn movies and the Michael Curtiz films, right, right, right. and 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 then and then they led me to they, 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 that also led me into into good old fashioned movie musicals. And I remember seeing Peter O'Toole in the you know not so well conceived, but but for me nostalgically beautiful Man of La Mancha, right? Which was a big a big turn point for me because when I saw that, I thought that's what I want to do. Now you really realize I was 15 years old and I wanted to play a 58 year old playing an 80 year old. That's what, and that's what I'm still striving for. But wow. I remember, I remember viscerally the impact it had on me because I went to my drama teacher in high school and I said, I want to do, we need to do Man of La Mancha. And I remember him saying to me, I'll never forget this, Mr. Graham, God rest his soul. He was wonderful. But he said to me, oh no, 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 you can't do that. You're not a good enough singer. And, and we need, if we're going to do that show, we need someone that can really sing. And, and I took a year and a half and figured out exactly what it was I wanted to do. I took some voice lessons. Uh, that was the year and a half that I really took my Wait voice Wait a minute. Lessons. When he said this, yes. in your mind, you immediately said, I'm going to go train. Yes. For something that's not even guaranteed that they're going to make. He said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that because they, they picked a musical every two oh years. Oh, my God. And I, I trained with a, a, a Canadian baritone. And I, I learned how to control my larynx. I learned how to drop my larynx. I learned how to breathe. And I learned opera. And and that foundation, it was it was a good eight months that I trained um, regularly. Did he know this, the teacher? No. He but, didn't? No, but on on the, the we had a, a school project the following, uh, two years later, that was, uh, we had to present a song and a scene. And how old are you? Uh, I was 17 years old. 17 years old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just turned 17. And we had to present a song and a scene. And I, I uh, hired an accompanist and I said, uh, I want to do mine last. So I want, because we had, we did two students each class until we got through the class. I said, I want to do mine last and I want a whole class. Uh, give me, give me the whole class. He's like, well, what, are you only doing one scene and one song? I said, I'm doing a little bit of a one act. And he said, okay. And so I went in and I did, I, I, I set up, I set the scene. I did one act of, I will impersonate a man. Come, enter into my imagination and see him. His name, Alonzo Quijana, a country squire no longer young, bony and hollow-faced, eyes that burn with the fire of inner vision. Being retired, he has much time for books, and he studies them from morn to night and often through the night as well, and all he reads oppresses him, fills him with indignation at man's murderous ways towards man. You are doing this to the whole class. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're supposed to sing. Yes. And then I said, no longer will he be plain Alonzo Quijana. And as I'm doing this, I'm putting on a mustache and putting on a wig and putting on the eyebrows. But a dauntless knight known as Don Quixote de la Mancha, hear me now, thou bleak and unbearable world, thou art base and debauched as can be, and a knight. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full confidence. Full, whole thing. You weren't even nervous. No, I knew it had to be done. And when I finished, my teacher said, fuck you, we'll do the show. And we did it. And that was. Are you kidding me? As a no. seventeen-year-old kid, yeah, you have you. I, I don't even know. I mean, I've never had drive like that. I mean, it's the only thing I ever wanted. It's the only thing I've ever been remotely good at, and it still fuels uh, every aspect of my life. I mean, look, other than my children and my my family, my wife, it's really. I mean, it's boring. It's terrible, but it's all I like. It's all I like. You you love, do you love to audition? Look, I would love it if I knew that for every X amount of auditions, I would get <laughs> X amount of jobs. It's not that I love to audition and it's not that I hate to audition. Okay. Um, I love when a specific task is placed before me and they say, do, you know, we need to see you do this. I love that. Right. Uh, and the more specific, the better for me because, because then it takes the guesswork out. I, I would love to think that after certain displays of some skill that, uh, that certain correlative projects might not require uh, so much audition and that maybe somebody would be like, oh, wait, if he could do X, Y, and Z, we only need him to do B. Yeah, yeah, bring this guy in. Let's have a meeting with him. Right. Sometimes it's a little, it can feel a little like, gosh, really, they need to see it? Okay. But I, 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 I provided it's something that I think I can add value to and that will add value to my life that I'll enjoy doing. I don't turn down an audition because at the end of it all, I don't want to not get a job because I was too lazy to put my hat in the ring. 
Do you learn lines quickly? I can't audition unless I know them all. Uh, if I'm not fully memorized, I don't want to read on it. And how long will it take you to, let's say, do- so I developed two- a skill recently. Well, not recently. I developed, when I was when I was doing Broadway, uh, and all of my Les Mis friends can attest to this because I still play poker with them every Sunday. When I was doing Broadway, I all I used to say to the guys was, I'm going to be a movie star one day. I'm going to be a movie star one day. I'm going to be a movie. And they used to make fun of me. They're like, yeah, you'll be a movie star one day. Good luck. And uh, I, I, I remember getting my first TV audition when I was in New York for like th- third watch or something. And, and it was like for two lines and I sucked because I spent so much time like combing my hair the way I thought the character's hair would be. I didn't even fucking look at the lines. For and two I, lines. Yeah, I just biffed. I wasn't good. And I wasn't good because I wasn't prepared the way I should have been prepared. And I, I, I remember the first time I ever got a call back was when I memorized the line. I just memorized the lines. I didn't even give a particularly good performance. I just was looking at the casting director and engaged in the scene. And, and, and they were like, oh, we'd love to see, we'd love to have you come back for the director. And this like light went off in my head of like, oh ah. shit, I just need, if I know my lines, I'm probably like 50% better off than the schmucks that are, that have got their faces sure. buried in the page. And at least I'm gratifying the writer by, by showing deference and respect to the material. And then if I can add to that some layer of creative choice and, and character, well, then maybe I've got a shot at this. And, and it was, it was really interesting because it was in the season that followed that, we had gone, I, I, I met my wife on the subway and we went out to LA. She was an aspiring actor. She was 22, but looked like she was 16. And so I would drive her to auditions and they'd say, your dad has to wait outside <laughs> because I was 26 and I looked like I was 40. And, and uh, what happened though was when I started getting some small co- co-star auditions, it was just being memorized that would get me it would get me to the next stage. Isn't and, that something? And just being prepared. It. Just, just casting directors seeing that this guy put the time in. That's it. And now we could work with him. Well, this is it. And it's also not egg on their face when they bring me in for, for the network or they bring me in for a director uh, that, that I'm going to be prepared. Now, look, I had a friend that went to like his third audition and he was reading a book. And when they called him in, he, he still had the book in his hand. He didn't know the lines. And he just had the je ne sais quoi. And he got right. like a 10-year gig on some show. And I, I, I just, that's never been me. You know what I mean? For me. Me neither. It, 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 I, I, I always I, have to work. It's not only, it's not only always have to work. It's, it's <laughs> after 35 years, I still haven't cracked after the job is done. It's literally right back to the drawing board. And I mean, it's, and especially now in COVID, though I'm not auditioning for anyone. I am, I'm self-taping, which is effectively, it's a pre-casting. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. I'm making a tape in my studio without any direction. And I'm, someone reading lines off camera? Yeah, so sometimes I'll have someone zoom the lines in. Sometimes my wife will put the baby to bed and she'll come in and read with me. And that's horrifying right. because it's my wife seeing me at my most insecure, right. you know, and, and she's, she's so good. And for her, things come so easily. So, so it is this really amazing thing that after all these years and after, you know, maybe, you know, some successes and whatever, it still all goes back to make a tape. Maybe a casting associate sees it. Maybe the casting director sees it. Maybe they get it to the producer. Maybe that, you know what I mean? It's, it's still that. It's, right. it's now that's not to say that an offer won't come here and there without a tape, but what's an offer that you have, you've had, what are offers? I like, mean, let me, let me name something. Red notice. Did you, you get an offer? No, no. I auditioned for that. True and, story. And, uh, no, no. I, I auditioned and then I had to have a, a zoom meeting as well. The no. Kennedys. Oh, well, actually Sinatra was an offer, but it was after I had done uh, 24 with, with, with Joel Cernow, but also I, I auditioned to play Bobby and they liked my Bobby, mm. but, but uh, they hired the right Bobby. They hired Barry Pepper, who's a great actor, great. Uh, but they, they said, Hey, look, we, we're not going to have you for Bobby, but do you want to be Frankie? And I, of course I said, yeah, of right. course. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. But what are some roles that you out of 10 auditions that you go out for, let's say 10, yeah. how many do you get a call back for? Be honest. Don't do even if, even if it's nine, be, you know, you, listen, man. So, okay. Cause I you work hard. I could tell. So I have a feeling that you probably get called back or you're up in the mix listen, for many, many roles. I, I, so we are, what is this? We're in uh, December of 2021, right? Okay. And we hit the pandemic. So I, I came to Los Angeles. We left New York. During in, the in, pandemic, you yeah. left New York to come to the ba- In to, June. To LA. Yes. We left, we left New York in okay. June. We just had a baby and we didn't know where we were going to live. We found a house. I built a studio. We were able, I was able to sort of, you know, get, carry on with the animation stuff. And then when auditions started to come in, I started putting myself on tape. 
uh, between, I would say between August of 2020 and now, I uh, I have auditioned probably on average at least at least two times a week. Two times and a week. I have booked off of those auditions one job. Two times a week since August mm -hmm. of 2020. So roughly, I'd say like 55, 60. 55, 60 auditions and you booked one. What was the one you booked? It was True Story. It was True Story on Netflix. Yeah. Which yeah. is one of the biggest shows now, isn't it? Like and they've the, done a great job, man. It, it is. It's, I think it's the number one series on Netflix right now. And Red Notice, you mentioned, is the number one movie on Netflix, which is great. And, and that was a, a process that the audition for that, I changed the character to make him Greek because I wanted to find a way in that felt organic to me. And it was all good. I was set to be a pudgy Greek billionaire arms dealer. <laughs> and then two and a half weeks in, it was a flag on the play. Rawson called me and said that apparently Ryan had done a movie recently where there was a, a pudgy Greek bad guy. And he was like, we don't want to do that again. So right. uh, he said, I, I think I'm going to need to recast this. And I said, no, 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 no. Actually, I was going to call you. <laughs> I've got a great idea. He should be. And I, and, 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 and I sort of pulled this out of my ass. I was like, he should be <laughs> of unknown European origin. And he was like, well, what does he sound like? I was like, well, that's the thing. His dad strangled him. So his voice is broken. And he was like, oh, I love that. We'll call him Soto Voce. I was like, yes. And he's like, and I want him to be a- Wait a minute, this came about, your character came about in Red Notice mm -hmm. on a phone conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, the character was written, but the but the new and, the new and character. improved- uh, The new and improved character, yeah. Soto Voce. Soto Voce. Hence, I like this. Yes, yeah, I, I used a little uh, Sean Harris. Uh, I just love that idea of, so his dad, <laughs> his, his dad strangled him and he was left with this paralyzed vocal cord. Which I loved. It was fun. That's do, do they talk about it in that? Yeah. Well, so in or there, is it more subtext. It, 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 they, w there were uh, more. There were more scenes that sort of uh, pointed to it. You hear it in, in 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 subtext. You hear it in some of the dialogue, and you hear it even in some of my characters' dialogue. But it's sort of a, a like a blink and you'll miss it uh, uh, moment. Wow. But yeah, no. All this is to say, look, I I, I one I, booking in fifty five to sixty. What does that tell you? What I mean, if you had to. Uh, to talk to fellow actors out yeah. there or people who are trying to become an actor. How hard is it to be an actor? It's 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 what my buddy Nick Wyman always says. Your job is to audition. Just just shut up and do the audition. It's it might be a chance for you to act. You might not have acted in a while. So just and and look, I, you asked me how I memorize lines. I do a thing where I I read through the material, all of it, the the the, the stage direction, all the lines. I read through it as many times as it takes me to be able to read it out loud as fast as I possibly can read it without tripping over a single word, regardless of whether it's my dialogue or not. If I trip over the word, I have to start all over again. And I just keep doing it. It's, it's basically like running it in Italian to do it to the point where I can speak it so quickly that I'll never, you know, I, I won't, I, I won't trip over a single word. And so if it's, I, it's just, it's, it's almost like you're getting, you're exhausted probably learning this. That's it. And in my tongue. Exhausted. It's, I, I fully exhaust myself. And then I realize, oh, I totally know what the scene's about because I've read it a hundred times or 200 times or 300 times. And then when I know what the scene's about, then the pressure's off because then the lines are there because they make sense because the scene is very, very clear. I get it. I know right, what the character's right. trying to do. Um, but no, I, I mean, look, I, I, I'm I doing uh, the second season of Made for Love this year, which is a great right, show on, on yeah. HBO, which I love. And that was an offer, which was really nice. And that came about through, I think, through some of my past work on HBO. It came about through Silicon Valley and... and uh, and that's that's a real joy, and it's you know it's rare to be able to be on a show that I watched and then didn't have to audition for, and, and they and they called me in. Inside of you is brought to you by Geico. We love our Geico. Look, whether you rent a home or own a home, and that could be hard work, as we all know. Uh, you know, it's easy bundling policies with Geico. You see, Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing because we already have so much damn stuff to do around the house, Ryan, you know? It's damn true. It, you just want to make your life easier. Bundling policies with Geico. Geico, you know the name. You're not going to get fooled by these guys. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, see how much you can save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Inside of You is brought to you by Magic Spoon. It's the new year, folks, and Magic Spoon is perfect for meeting your goals, whether it's eating healthy or saving more time in your morning routine. 
Magic Spoon has it all. And growing up, you know, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid, Ryan. You remember growing up. Oh, I remember it. You know, I'm still but, doing it. But, you know, but we had to, I had to give that up. At my age, I had to give it up because I realized it's full of sugar yeah. and junk that you really shouldn't eat. Yep. You, you, the cholesterol skies, the sh- your sugar, sc- you start getting diabetes or whatever the heck it is. Oh, the diabetes. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and we're all trying to eat better, but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. And that's why we have our Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. And it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed. You know what I mean? They've got it all. Uh, Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. And only 140 calories per serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And you can build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. They just come out with more and more My God. flavors. I really love Magic Spoon. Magic <sighs> Spoon, thank you. It's so easy, guys. People, My friends have asked me about Magic Spoon. I say, just try it. You're going to love it. And they do. And here's what you can do. You can go to magicspoon.com slash IOU to grab a custom bundle of cereal and start your new year off right. And be sure to use the promo code IOU at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash IOU and use the code IOU to save $5 off. And thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. You know what's tough about getting uh, an offer? For, it sounds so great, and it's amazing when someone gives you an offer yeah. for a role. But um, I've had this happen where I, I came on set after they you know, went through the contract, worked it out, one of the leads. I get on there, and they want me to do something totally different. Yeah. So if you audition for it and they like you, it's based on your audition. You yeah. know what you're doing. Yeah. And then you get there with an offer and no audition, and now they want to change things up. Well, and you're yeah, like, it, I don't know what the fuck I'm it, doing. It can be tenuous. I will say for Silicon Valley, I was such a fan of the show that when I got the audition for Russ Hanneman, it was supposed to be a two to three uh, episode arc, right. but I loved it. I was like, let me in. And I, when I auditioned for it, I had so many different versions of the way that I wanted to do it <laughs> that I gave them like five different, I gave him like a Matt McConaughey version where he was kind of like a little more laid back, a little more laid back. In okay, each boy. take? Yes, a, a t- totally different Were thing. Were they like, what is he doing? Right, and yet when I got the part and I, my agent called and was like, it looks like you got this part. I said, find out which version they want. Yeah, and send could, me the version. Because they're so really different that. fucking versions. Yeah. And I remember, and, and and I was like, have you asked? He's like, we've asked, we've asked, we haven't heard anything. And, and, and they're like, okay, you're on set tomorrow. I was like, which fucking version is gonna be? And I show up and there's Mike Judge. And I was like, hey, um, uh, Mr. Judge, listen, I just, I, you know, he's like, oh yeah, great, great. I'm glad you're here. I was like, do you know which version of the of the character you want? And he was like, yeah, yeah, no, whatever you did is good. It's funny. You're good. And I was like, like but I did five different ones. <laughs> but what I loved about that, what they, he was like, <laughs> just go fucking do it. Just do it. Yeah, you're good. You think it's all that different. It wasn't that different. It's still you. Just, just do it. And, uh, and it was, wow. it was, it was, it, I was like, okay. And then Alec was like, give Give us a Alec, re- Alec Berg, who, okay. who by the great Alec Berg, fucking Alec Berg from Seinfeld, mm-hmm. which is like the only show that I watch when I'm in my trailer. Seinfeld's on the. I background. just had Jason Alexander on the podcast. He was oh, brilliant. He was oh, brilliant. I loved. Wasn't that great? He was so great. Oh man, I wish I could have been. I'm yeah. the biggest Seinfeld fan there is. The biggest Seinfeld fan there is. We talked about the marine biologist. Oh. We talked about that whole episode where oh. they. Didn't they give him that monologue at the last? At minute? the last, they talked yeah. about it. We talked about it. Oh, but, can you do that? The sea was angry that day, my friends. No, I didn't mean that. (laughs) (laughs) The actual sea was going to do the scene from uh, Marine Biologist. No, I mean, can you do that on the off the cuff? Listen, what's funny is the more pressure there is attached to something, the more I can perform. If it's an audition and it comes up last minute, it's like pulling fucking teeth. But if I have to go on stage and do something, I just buckle in and do it. And that's what Christmas Story Live was because I had this giant. Uh, uh, you know, no, 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 this huge dance number, oh. this massive, like, like, uh, Bugsby Berkeley dance number that right. we never rehearsed on the actual set because it wasn't ready until performance day. That's terrifying. And the first time I did it, complete with a costume change on set and a front flip and all of this, the first time I did it was the time that we recorded it and it was live. How was it? 
it was exhilarating because I did it. And my wife says, there's this one moment in the, in the bloody song where you see in my face where I've gotten through like all of these hurdles. And there's this look in my face of like, motherfucker, I just did that. Like this, 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 this matters because like you were yourself for a, yes, a split for nuance, a split nuance of holy I shit. I did that. I did I that. Did yes. It. Back to the character. Yes. Yes. Now back in. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrific. Do you get nervous? Do you get nervous when you're on set? Do you get nervous for an audition? Do you get nervous in meetings? Do you, and how do you deal with that if you do? I do. I get nervous every time. Um, get nervous with everything? I have a, a standard level of anxiety and I'm a perfectionist and I, I, I have this thing that, that, that still after all these years hasn't gone away. I'm just... I'm eager to please. I just want it all to go right. I know. I want Don't it to. All? Yeah. I, and I think that's, that's, I had a friend recently that said to me, you can afford to be cocky. And I was like, I, I can't, I can't because right when I think I can be cocky about something, particularly in the industry, it, it's so ephemeral. It goes, yeah. it's the hardest thing to get. And it's the easiest thing to lose that, that, that the moment that you love. So yes, I do get nervous. I, I, I step onto set. I feel good. I feel prepared. I think the more prepared I can be, the less nervous I'll feel. It's the wild cards that throw me. I'm fully prepared. I know what I'm doing. I got everything. And then a director will come up and give me a note. That's so left field of anything. I thought it makes your nerves kind of peak. Oh, it's just this notion of, oh fuck. Like I've got this all figured out completely wrong. Mm. And, and so that makes me nervous. Auditions now are very different than they were, but, you know, going in to meet producers or going into a, to a test to meet, you know, studio executives, that's a nerve wracking experience it because is. they're also asking you to do something that's so inorganic to what the actual end result is. You know, the end result is you're on a set that's closed and you're doing a performance that's nuanced and small and for the screen. When you go in to book these massive jobs, you're in a boardroom you know, with all of these executives around the table and you're giving a performance right. that, 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 you know, you have to nuance in the right direction. It, it can't be what you're going to ultimately do on the day because they too won't. Small. Yes, there's no charisma there. You know, they can't see it. And right. it can't be a, hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah. then they're going to be like, oh, it's too big. So right. it really is. I mean, look, with Stooges, oh my God. I couldn't. Get I remember testing for the Fairley Brothers for that. I remember going in a room and there was Sean Hayes and there was like. So I bet you were there. How many auditions did you have? I had three. I had one where I sent my tape in to one of the producers. Then they brought me in, and then I came in with a bunch of uh, you guys. I had. I still have the audition, and I, I'm proud of it. I had a wig, and I was like, you know, you fucking killed it. I had 14 over six months. 14, dude. When I heard about this, I called my agent, oh my, my manager, golly. and I said, I'm the biggest Stooge fan there is. I got to go in and I got to go do this. And she said, you're not a celebrity and you're not a comedian. I don't think I can get you an appointment. And it was a friend of mine that called me that was like, hey, are you going to the Stooges thing? And I was, he's like, you're a Stooge fan, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, are, are you going? I was like, yeah, yeah. When are you going? He's like, I'm going on Friday. I was like, yeah. Where is that? He's like, well, I was like, where is it again? Did you just show up? Yep. You, hold on a second. You had no audition, no agent representation going into that. I mean, you had a, an agent. I had an agent, yeah. But you, you just you just signed in? I went to a Hasidic wig shop and bought a wig. <laughs> I cut a wig. I went to a foam, <laughs> latex foam store, and I padded my neighbor's suit. My neighbor's much bigger than me so that I could lose my neck and fill out some girth. And I got to the audition. And at the audition, there was a big sign that said, do not come in character. And I, and I walked in there and I saw these guys in jeans and a t-shirt. And I was like, what, the, how the fuck are they going to find Mo, Larry and Curly like looking like th this is ridiculous. And so when the casting director came out, I remember it was Rick Montgomery. He opened the door and he went, Hey, I, uh, he looked at me in costume. It was a ridiculous fucking costume, but he was just like, Oh God. All right, come on in. And I, and I went in and it was one, there was one page of sides. It was just one page of sides. I didn't have and you had that little bowl cut had the bowl cut and I didn't do the sides. I did a, I did a, uh, I did a bunch of little things from, from the shorts. You, you, you know, you, you see that store over there? Each one of us grab a broom. We go out and we sweep in front of the place. The boss comes out, sees three conscientious guys and offers us a job. It's simple. Come on, get gone. I did, I did all this shit and they Perfect. were like, huh. And then, and then they were like, okay, come back. Um, and, 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 and I got a note and they were like, your costume's terrible. So you, if you're going to come in costume, you got to do something better. So I, I hired Christian Tinsley, who did the makeup for the Passion of the Christ. 
And I got him to do under eye bags on me and a full face cast. And I, my wife was doing a show you at Warner Brothers. You fucking went above and beyond what anybody else would do. And you didn't even have an audition. I had to get you it. You didn't have, I had to get it. I was the guy. I had to, I had to, I had to get it. And I, I, I broke into the Warner Brothers costume warehouse and I borrowed a fat suit and period clothes. And I went back over and over and over again. They kept bringing me back, kept bringing me back, kept bringing me back. And then I wouldn't hear anything for In weeks. costume, in like you- I never went out, not only in costume, in character. I'll sign in and, hi, hi boss, how you doing? I never, ever, ever- Were people e looking at you like, holy- Yes, they thought I was a fucking lunatic. And-, and Who cares? And, and Pete was, Pete would go, hey, it's Mo. It's Mo and 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 Bob and Bobby was like, yeah, you do. You, you you got the Mo thing. I was like, oh, thank you very much. And they were like, all right, all right. And I would anytime I'd go in, I'd try and find a moment to do something slapsticky. Like in one of my auditions, I pretended I didn't see the chair. I fell right over it, and uh, and they all got up from their chairs like they thought it really happened. And 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 it, it, it every moment was a chance to show them a little bit more that I understood Jesus. the Stooges. But dude, I got my heart broken so many times because I remember reading Variety right after an audition right after one of the auditions that Johnny Knoxville got the part. And I was like, oh my God. And then, and it turns out Pete told me that he did have the part. They offered it to him, he accepted. And then uh, Pete and Johnny had a talk and Johnny was like, well, I'm not gonna do an impression because I don't. that's not what I do. It's gonna be like the modern Mo. And Pete was like, no, 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 this is the Stooges. And, and Johnny was like, I, I'm not sure this is gonna work. And so then they went back to the drawing board and they, more auditions. And then I, I read, uh, sorry, then my manager called and said, I'm sorry, it's the end of the line. They have offered it to Hank Azaria. And they had. And uh, and he would have been one of them. They just kept going. They saw Mo right in front of them and they kept going around. But he wanted too much money. And I wrote a letter uh, to the head of Fox at the time, basically a plea for why they should hire me. And in the letter, I said, I'll do it for free. Don't pay me. And uh, and they didn't. <laughs> they, they took me up on it, man. Yeah, it cost me money to do that movie because I had to move my newborn and my wife to Atlanta for sixteen weeks, and uh, and I got paid. Uh, what was it? Schedule sch Schedule F. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. They really didn't pay you. No, they paid you as minimal as they could for the, being the star of the movie. The lowest I could have possibly. What gotten. is that? What is Schedule F? Tell people what Schedule F is. I got thirty. Schedule F is fuck off. I got thirty two thousand dollars for 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 that movie. $32,000, 16 weeks in Atlanta, and it's probably costing you half that to live there. Oh yeah, no, no, it cost us, it, it co I think it cost us, it, I ended up uh, factoring, it cost me about $16,000 to keep the place in Los Angeles, move to Atlanta and, you know, and be there. Was it a dream come true though? It was. You know, I, it's funny, man. It, it wasn't a perfect movie, um, but it was a perfect experience. How um, are the Fairley brothers to work with? They're lovely. You know, they're 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 salt of the earth guys. They are they're the antithesis of any sort of um, auteurs, right? But they still create memorable, uh, um, uh, massively globally impactful movies, right? right? But they do it without any pretense. They're they are exactly what you would expect them to be, um, and they're. Um, they were there. It was, it was a, a unique, singular and marvelous experience. And Sean, Will and I will be forever connected in, in that regard. I mean, those are the, the, those Sean and Will, if they ever call or need anything or I, I, it's, I'm, they're, they're my How boys. did they get away with giving you Schedule F for a studio film? I, I've just never heard that before. Mm -hmm. Schedule F is something that you hear about with independent movies. Everybody's getting Schedule F. We're getting the same money. It's uh, what, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, Favored Nations. I was going to say United yeah. Nations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, same <laughs> yeah, it's thing. The United Nations. Same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it just is is baffling. Did you? I mean, did your agents try to fight that, or you did know, you just say, "I want this. Don't even bother." I was so listen, man. That's crazy. It's, it's crazy. crazy. It's funny, right? But but how often in our lives? Forget about our careers as actors, but how often in our lives are we ever faced with an opportunity to? Uh, inhabit and pay homage to something that had a massive impact on us as children. I mean, to really be a part of something, you gotta understand, it wasn't like I was, oh yeah, I like the Stooges. No, 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 no. I had, my brother for Christmas when I was 13, got me the the print of Mo, Larry and Curly on the golf course. It was on my, it was on my wall. Like, I mean, I was upset, I was obsessed with the Stooges. So uh, yeah, you know, I remember, I don't even remember 
care when they called, they're like, this is the offer. I was like, right. Yeah, I got the offer. You know what I mean? And as a matter of fact, (laughs) this is a good story. Please. This is a good story. I didn't get the offer. (sighs) My God, I can't fucking believe this happened. I'm still remembering it. Yeah. So I don't hear anything after my last audition. I don't hear anything. And then- And you're uh, going crazy. I'm going nuts. And then I get a call from from my agent who said, it looks like they want to do a proper screen test with you, Sean and Will. And Pete and Bob are going to do this on the Fox lot. And, and Pete called me and said, listen, the studio is starting to waffle on how they feel about bringing this movie forth. And we feel like we want to show them exactly what we want to do. So we want to make a scene, a proper scene from the movie. And he said, no pressure, but this really is, he said, and I said, and I said, wait, what does this mean? He goes, doesn't mean you got the part, but I want you to do this with us. And it's going to kind of live or die on if this works. So you'll get the part, but if it doesn't work, we're not making the fucking movie. So, you know, no pressure. So I go and- And you I, drive the scene. I'm sure Mo drives all the scenes. It, yes. It, M- Mo definitely did drive the scene. And we did the scene and it was great. But then I don't hear anything. Again. For two and a half fucking No weeks. one calls you. But I'm dying. And at this point, my stomach is like eating itself, okay? And I get a call. I'm, I'll never forget this. I'm driving through Laurel Canyon right around here. Right. And the reception is for shit up oh, around yeah, here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay? And I get a call. And I and I and it's a, it's a 310 number that I don't recognize. And I pull over. And, and I'll, I'll, uh, is this Mo? And I said, yeah, it's Pete Farrelly. And I said, I said, hi. He goes, well, 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 what the hell, man? Are you doing our movie or not? And I, and I was like, wait, what? He goes, you, you, you got the offer, you know, right? And I said, no, no, wait, what? Oh, oh, oh my God, thank you. And he's like, call your agent. So I call my agent. And my agent says, yeah, well, yeah, no, no, we got the offer. It's, it's, it's a shitty offer. They came in with no money. And I was like, wait, wait. I've been going, so my entire life, I've been working toward getting this role. Six months, I've auditioned for this thing 14 times and we got the offer and you didn't tell me. Well, no, no, we were going to tell you. That. And I, 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 I snapped. Snapped. And I, it was, it was just this, okay, you're fired. It's done. Like, it, it, it's done. You fired them. I had, are you kidding? How, I mean. It's it's this. The, it's the, your the, dream, and the, they're shitting. Come on, on it. now, listen. I understand. And by the way, I would have loved it if they doubled the offer or tripled it or whatever the hell it. But call me, call me. This is your dream. This is my fucking You've dream. Been I'm slaving in there, dying, dying, dying. And it was in the middle of pilot season too, where in between these auditions, I would go in and make it to studio and not make it to network, or make it to network and I was the second choice, or make it to studio, make it to network. I'm the choice, and then the pilot doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So you fired them on that call. It happened right then and there. You said you're fired. And what did they say? And they said, you're overreacting. And I said, I've never been more sanguine in my life, in my career, you're fired. And, and I, it wasn't an easy thing because I really liked my agents. Uh, but I wouldn't have used the word sanguine because I'm not exactly sure what it means. <laughs> but I applaud you for, for doing that. That, I mean, chutzpah. I had to. I had to for, for my nine-year-old self and for my 90-year-old self. I had to. Wow. Yeah. Did you ever meet anybody related to Mo? Or any family yes, members? I did. There was a time where Will and I were invited to Philadelphia for, I think it was a Stooge convention in honor of Larry. And I met Mo's, I want to say I met Mo's daughter and I met some of his family and they even gave me the most beautiful, Mo, Mo made uh, clay and ceramic things. Uh, it, you still was, have them? I have this beautiful bathtub that he made with his little signature Mo face on the bottom of it. Get it's it's of one of my little precious little- Do you have the keys. poster in your house? Uh, I do. Yeah. I have it in my studio actually. You have a studio? Yeah. Yeah. What, what other things do you have in your studio? I have my first, the first ever drawing of my Mickey Mouse that Paul Rudish oh, did for me, uh, which which is marvelous. I have uh, some renderings of my Darkwing Duck, which which I did uh, for 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 Ducktales, I, I, and I did a pilot where I was going to be uh, the new Darkwing. Uh, for Mickey Mouse audition, by the way, how many? W- w- how did you go in and say like two lines? And that no, was it? no, 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 no. That was so. I I think I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but I. You know, I passed on it at first. Right, right. Yeah, you yeah, said that. And, yeah, yeah. But but th- it was um, we went to the old animation building, and I had to revoice the entire Brave Little Taylor. So it was all the original original score and original voices, other than you know me going in and doing waltz. Ah, oh, yes, Your Honor, and how 
I was all alone. I heard them coming. I looked up. They were here, there, everywhere. A whole bunch of them. Yeah, I had to redo the whole thing. And then they anim- wow. they, they revoiced that old animation. It's one of the most exhilarating things I've ever done. Holy shit. You've Man. got to do some cool fucking things. Yeah, I, I, am, I, am, I got a horseshoe up my I mean, you portrayed Robin Williams behind the camera, which I have to see now. And like, how hard is that to portray? I mean, he's so physical. So- and- when, so nuanced, so all over the place. I remember my manager at the time called and said, so there's this, and he's like, look, these movies are sort of these salacious, you know, behind the scenes of Three's Company or Charlie's Angels or whatever it is. He's like, they're doing a Mork and Mindy one. It's like a low budget thing. They're going to shoot it in Vancouver in like 12, 13 days, or whatever it is. But they need a Robin Williams and they can't find it. And and I remember saying, and my wife is usually the one to sort of remind me why I do what I do. I was like, eh. I was like, I love Robin Williams. I, I adore him, but I'm not Robin. I don't look anything like the guy. I don't sound anything like him. And she said, okay, well, who would you cast? I was like, I don't know, like Jim Carrey or whatever. I, 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 would, I wouldn't. I, she said, who would you cast? She said, Jim Carrey's not going to do a, a $500,000 movie. Who would you cast? I said, I don't know. She goes, well, if you don't know, then you should audition for it. And, and, and I went on a deep dive. I, 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 you know, looked at all the inside the actor studio stuff and I looked at all his old stand up, and there was some, some stand up tapes that my brother had, my older brother that were way too old for me that I remember watching some of his stuff in San Francisco. And, uh, and, and I, I realized that, man, I was a huge Robin Williams fan. I mean, I, I, I was really, really engaged in what he did uh, from stand up to all of his movies. And I remember when Goodwill Hunting came out, I had that on a loop on in my VHS. I watched it over and over and over and over again. Right. So I guess a lot sort of, uh, sort of by osmosis, uh, sort of impacted how I, I, I was able to sort of recreate that. And I realized when I was able to find his voice and how he sort of held himself and how he, how he talked and, and, and sort of, there was kind of a, a quiet element to him and, and how he, he really didn't, well, he really didn't want the attention, but well, he would take it. I mean, joke me if you can't take a fuck. And there was this, this sort of. <laughs> Jeez, um, it's so this, good. <laughs> it, it was this moment of like, oh, fuck. Like, all right, well, his shoulders were higher and that affects how he sounds. And and, and he had kind of a, 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 a very kind and almost a, a pleasant, his lips were, there was this, and it was like, oh, fuck, if I can. I think I might be able to do that. And and so I thought, okay, but the only way I'm going to do this is if I can look in the mirror and see it. So I, I hired a wig maker and I went to my optometrist and I got contact lenses made and and I found Jeez. rainbow suspenders and I walked around the city in New York like that for a week and got on the bus and thanks chief. Okay, I'll see you later. And, and, and sort of lived it. And then I went to the audition fully in character. And I remember it was Stephen O'Neill at NBC and it was at the Rockefeller Center. And you had to like sign in and all, and I fully went in in character and, and Steven had seen me for a million other things. And he was like, hi, Chris. And I was like, oh, hello. And he was like, oh Christ. Like he was just like, what are you doing? But I didn't break it. And I went in and I had a whole routine set up. And I also realized, cause I had the script for that, that, Crazy. that they, all the impressions that they had in there, they weren't gonna be able to use them because it was an unauthorized biography. And all those impressions were things that he had done. And I knew that they were gonna be in trouble. So I came up with all these impressions that we hadn't seen him do. And uh, and it all ended up in the film. I had a, a re- that, that was a, a turning point. For and me you as an were actor. like, I can't do this. I couldn't even do an impression. You, yeah. And in the beginning, you really yeah. didn't have any idea how to None. do this guy. No, zero. And 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 it wasn't until I watched Goodwill Hunting again and realized I'd remember. I mean, I knew that entire film inside out and backwards. That it was like, oh gosh, I actually do understand his cadence, where he resonates, how he speaks. And I know it sounds like such a surfacey thing, just finding the voice, but but it's I not. I want you, it's so funny, because I'm like, I, I wish that we weren't on this podcast right now, because I'd want you to teach me how to do it. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's physiognomy. So if, 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 if you can, well, if you can look. Well, I suppose it, it does this. <laughs> how do you do that? Your arms and you're like, well, it's, well, it's. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, it's funny. It's, it's watching what his mouth and his lips and his tongue and his face and, and, and where he resonated and, 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 
and he would also sort of change it some it, it, when he would did his mork it would it would shift and it's how he would shift so you have to look like him to sound like it was a really neat right. yeah but then it's also like you don't want it to just be an SNL sketch right you want it to actually be a living breathing human being so there are uh, other elements too i could talk to you forever this fun this is fun <laughs> this is like i'm like i haven't even looked at any notes or anything it's just so exciting to hear like what you do and what you what you what you do to go after a role and what it takes to really be an actor. And it makes me feel like I, I just haven't done enough. No, that's not it, true. Well, I mean, it, look, yeah. I've done, like, I, I feel like I've done some good work in my life, done some stuff that w no one has seen. But at the same time, I'm like, I look at an actor like you and you really, really put in the work and you don't question it. You really go after it. I'm pathological and about it though. And, and, and I do have to say, I don't think it's the only way in. I, I think that there are, there, there, look, you have done remarkable work. You've done lasting work. And, and, and I, I don't think that there's, I think there are, there are many ways to get to, to the end. I think for me, I, I'm, I, I've been so moved by the performances in movies and TV that have shaped who I am, that I look at every opportunity that I am on screen as a chance to do something that could end up being that for someone, right? right. So I, I, I look, and I talk to my agents about this all the time. They'll be like, oh, it's just an audition. It's coming in, it's up for, it's tomorrow. It's like, you don't know how much effort I put into these auditions. It's not just an audition. Yeah. It's, a perf it's a real performance sure. for me. I give a piece of myself and it sounds cheesy, but it's true. Yeah, I don't, I mean, when they say, "Hey, you got an audition tomorrow," it's Ugh. like I need a few days. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, I've recently, I've, I've, because I'm taping by myself, I've come up with a way where I have a screen, and if it's last minute and I have to do it, I'll even put the sides up on a screen. And how, how and, do you do that? Yeah, so that's that's you know finding an eye mark on the screen with the sides and and framing my hand out. Of, of where where the mouse is and just and scrolling through and finding a way to do it, but I, I will have to say I do have to say that it's not as good. I'd say I'd say tw like nineteen times out of twenty, I, I I end up scrapping it and telling them if they if they if you can give me an extra couple of days, I'll learn it and I'll do it. But there there have been a few times where it's like oh shit, so that has it ever crashed. worked? Yeah, uh, I don't know that it's ever worked that I've booked anything from it. Has it ever worked? Yes. It actually has. It did work one red time. Red Notice. No, <laughs> no, no it wasn't no. Red Notice. No, no, it wasn't Red Notice. What was it? It was, uh, I did a, a small part for this uh, upcoming uh, Daisy Jones and the Six that, that Amazon is doing. Uh, and it was a last minute thing. It was just a quick thing, but I didn't have time to memorize it. They wanted it that day. I did it and, um, and, and, I, and I got it. So that was fun. And then you learned it. And then I learned it, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. I mean, you've done so many things. You always appear in all these things. I mean, you're playing, uh, you know, uh, opposite Gal. You say Gal Gadot. I've I do say you. Gal Gadot. Is it Gal yeah. Gadot? I, I think it's Gadot. Gadot. I think that's what it is. Ryan, I, are we I've going with Gadot? It. It sounds good to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Ryan Reynolds and The Rock, and you're working with all these great people. And it's just like, the more I talk to you, the more I feel like, of course you are. Oh, that's you nice should be you working with all these people. I, it's you uh, should be i i really truly as corny as it sounds do feel like it's uh, we're lucky to get up and be able to do this for a living and and you know i i, I of course i want to keep progressing and i want to keep growing and doing more things uh but i i also just i, I really just want to keep moving my, my my wife always says to me just keep your head down and do good work and 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 because the rest of it is all it it's it's vapor it's all vapor Right, you know, I mean, you think about the lauded performances from 1989. I mean, like it, 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 it doesn't matter unless the experience is meaningful, right. uh, th because all of it's all air. It's just it's it, it doesn't it doesn't exist. Uh, so we might as well joke them if they can't take a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> if they if they can't take a fuck, is yeah. that what he said? Yeah. Well, it's fuck them, fuck, fuck them if they can't take a joke, and he flipped it. Joke them if they can't take a fuck. Which is brilliant. Joke them if they can't take a fuck. <laughs> How was that? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Well, I need a lot of work. Uh, mine All right, does th too. This is. Uh, by the way, you got to promise me mm. if you're ever up for an Oscar. Okay. You, you get you know one of these things. Yeah. You got to come back in the podcast, no matter how it, big you get. It, okay. So I, I'll That's make the that, deal. Uh, so, but we have to double edge that deal. So the deal is. A hundred percent. If I if become ever, the next David Letterman. <laughs> if you become the next David Letterman, you will, I'm, I'm your first motherfucking guest. You could be the first guest. Great, thank you. That's it. Okay, good. All right. This is called Shit Talking with Chris Diamantopoulos.
Did I say that right? You said it right. Look at that. Fucking just got it. You got it. You said it like my mother. These are my patrons. These are patrons who pay extra for the podcast. That They they support it. They love the podcast. They want it to continue. They give back. Cool. So they get to ask some questions. Great. Nico, I'm first generation Greek, America. I was wondering if there were any Greek traditions your friends here had a hard time wrapping their heads around (laughs) when you were growing up. Mine were name days. Oh, yeah. Name days. All right, Nico. Bravo, Nico. Que ευχαριστώ για την ερώτηση. Uh, I said, thanks, Nick. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, you know, my my Canadian friends growing up always f- felt like it was weird to see a full-skinned lamb on a spit in my backyard in April during Easter. because we First, roast- a skin lamb on the spit? We, yeah, we roast a lamb. And it's not just like, you know, it's you're not like barbecuing lamb piece. It's like a full lamb with the eyes and the teeth. Like, it's wow. a full beast. But we ate everything. And uh, yeah, so my, my friends were always like... Uh, that's really, that's really intense. There's a lamb on a spit. A lamb, a full lamb on a spit is a lot to look at. Uh, wow. Uh, Maddie S. Uh, loved how outrageous your character was in Red Notice. Oh. How did you prepare for the role? That's a nice question. And, and thanks mean, for the comment. Kind of talked about yes. Well, you Maddie. know what? I, I, I'll just say this. I had two. I had two weeks to get into the best physical shape of my life. And two weeks. Yeah. And uh, I, I fasted which I hadn't really done before. Does that really work? Yes. How, how now explain the fasting. Yeah. So intermittent Let's say you fasting. wake up, you wake yeah. up and mm-hmm. when do you eat? What, so, what time do you so eat? So this is what I would do. I would wake up and, and I would try to wake up as late as possible because the longer you sleep, the less you're awake and right. you're not eating. Uh, I would drink lots of water. I would drink black coffee and I would go for walks and drink water and drink coffee and go for walks. And then when it was about six or 7 PM, I would break my fast with some uh, grass fed red meat. And then I would go, fast to, again. go to sleep again and fast again. And, and I, you lost weight and got tight and ripped? Yeah. I mean, I probably lost, I probably only lost about like maybe eight or nine pounds, but uh, because I was training at the same time, everything just sort of vacuum sealed. And and I- at So 40, you worked out every day for two weeks? I, I didn't actually. The, the surprising thing is that it's it's 99% diet- is, is in terms of yeah. in terms of cinematic aesthetics of looking good on screen it's really what you eat not the gym i i trained once or twice a week that's it by the way i'm just this is completely uh, irrelevant to what we're talking yes. about but i'm watching you now and i'm thinking there's a great impression that you probably can do what? that you should do if not you should play this guy okay someday in a movie you should play johnny carson you know i was thinking the same thing actually i was thinking you know they should do I, I, I was, I would, it was off the top of my head. They should do a limited series where I play Johnny Carson. Look at this! I just looked at you and I was like, "You got to be Johnny Carson." You know, I, I do you I, do impressions of Johnny Carson? You've done that many times. I have not, but I will tell you this: I had heard that there is something percolating out there. I, I, I want to say you it. embody. Carson, you have this like I don't know what it is. I know there's that something relaxed. It's out and, there. And I some... think I think it's Adam uh, Adam uh, McKay. Yes, who's doing it? Um, I did not know that. Ed, weird, wild stuff. Great show tonight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. I. Uh, uh, Adam <sighs> McKay. If you're listening, come on. Throw throw a good Greek Canadian kid a bone here and let me let me in the room. I used to uh, Ed McMahon. Well, I worked with Ed McMahon on this crappy TV show that I did back in 98 called The Tom Show. It was with Tom Arnold, Ed McMahon. That wasn't a crappy show. That was a fun show. No, no, no. It was a really bad show. It was ranked 138 out of 137. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the kind of material I'm into. But I said, I, I used to say to Ed every day, I go, Ed, it, it was so cold this morning. And he goes, how cold was it, sir? <laughs> so cold, I saw Robin putting his worm in the microwave. <laughs> Weird, wild stuff, Ed. And so, but you, you nail it. Wow. Uh, Leanne. What character that you have portrayed are you the most like? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> I was going to say that. It was Mickey Mouse, isn't uh, it? Yeah, yeah, probably. I think so. What character that I've portrayed? Well, it's probably a combination of uh, Mo and Mickey Mouse because I'm, I'm not that bright, but I've got a lot of gumption. I think you're bright. You uh, segwine. <laughs> sanguine. <laughs> sanguine, see? That's what I'm telling you. You're segued to the sanguine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Jill E., what is better, The Rock's Tequila Ryan Reynolds gin or Trace Comas tequila? Trace Comas every Trace Comas? St- Come on now. Listen, sorry, DJ. Sorry, Ryan. But let's all be honest. And you got to try it. So my character on, on Silicon Valley has his this tequila called Trace Comas. Right. Uh, the Three Comma Club, because he's a billionaire. He's this obnoxious billionaire. Well, we actually made the tequila and sold it for a period of time. And surprisingly enough, it was delicious. Really? Yeah, yeah. If you can find a bottle of it, I highly recommend it. 
Trace Comas. Trace Comas. Trace Comas. Yeah. Danny, did Chris enjoy, that's you. Yes. Did you enjoy the physical comedy aspects of playing Marky Bark on oh. Arrested Development? Oh, that was marvelous. Listen, I enjoyed being in the presence of Mitch Hurwitz. Yeah, I worked with him too. Oh, he was a really smart guy. Well, and not only smart, but just a prince. And there was something about him. He's so um, Mozart-like in his understanding of what the overall scope of the of the of not only the episode but the whole series was going to be. That he would throw things out from behind the camera that felt like these like random suggestions, but he knew how he was going to weave them into his story. I loved that. Yeah. Uh, and 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 the character was this beautiful, clueless, but I love characters that are completely unaware of how clueless they are. And, and that was really, really fun to play. And, and such great collaborators on that entire set. That was marvelous. Well, I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, you get Red Notice on Netflix, which is, is just kicking ass on Netflix yeah, they right said now. It's the biggest Netflix movie ever. I mean, that's incredible. Crazy. And True Story. Which, which is, isn't it also doing it's, great? It's the number one series on, on Netflix right now. Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Oh yeah, that and that's coming out at Disney Plus on, on December 3rd. And that's just terrific for people that love that franchise. Inside Job. That's a great adult animated show on Netflix. It's super fun. I mean, you Netflix loves you. Well, I'm fortunate, man. I'll take it because I, I it's funny when, you know, when it's time to open a bottle of wine and have dinner in front of the TV, that's what we're putting on. This is just incredible. I mean, the amount of work you've done, what you're doing there's no stopping you man I, I i love it i love how humble you are but you're also a lot of fun you haven't lost that that kid spirit that inner child you could see it come out and it, it, you could see how much fun you have entertaining thanks man you know it's it's really cool man it's really cool you make it really easy this is a great for all the actors out there listening that are, that, that are that are gonna be invited here i highly recommend it this is this is like the best interview i've done this is fun really yeah well, holy shit! Yeah, so so yeah, let's let's. I, I'm I'm looking forward to you taking over the Tonight Show and me winning the Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been fun, Ryan. You have anything? No, this has been. I didn't know they made Trace Comas tequila though. You got You got to get on that. Um, yeah, because Ryan, I missed that. Ryan Fox. Well, you're Fox. Ryan Fox. Yeah, that's right. true. Yeah. Ryan Fox. If you don't know what we're talking about, it's on Silicon Valley. It's his character. It's Ryan Fox. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. This has been a really big treat. You're going to come back on the podcast, right? My pleasure. Yeah. I would love to have you back on. I'd love to hang out with you sometime. You're you're a great guy. Be fun. Uh, feelings mutual, man. Thanks for allowing me to be inside of you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wait, where have I heard that before? Uh, yeah. The show. Yes. Yes. Exactly. All right. I'm gonna have to give you a tumbler an inside you tumbler oh i want one for yeah, sure i'll give it to you now yeah oh, all right great. let's go uh that was one of my favorite interviews i think you could tell i, I it was really just it was effortless i am not over the robin williams impression just I, sitting in here listening to it just watching him transform un fucking real <laughs> uh, I loved I, it. but he's been doing it his whole life so i mean yeah well he, I he better whole, be good at it yeah well he's uh I really liked him. That guy fucks. <laughs> that guy fucks. What was that on? That was oh, on Silicon, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. That when he said God. that famous line. Um, again, thank you. Follow us on our handles at Inside of You Podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Inside of You Pod on the Facebook. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And then go to patreon.com slash inside of you if you want to support the podcast a little more. I, I welcome you to go there. I think you'll dig it. You can give anything to the podcast. 50 cents, a quarter, a dollar, whatever you want. I mean, you know, it just helps the podcast. Uh, and the Inside of You online store. Got tons of great stuff. Uh, Lexmas scripts signed by me. Smallville lunchboxes. Inside of You sh uh, shirts, I believe. I think we got so many tumblers and we've got lots of great stuff there. So check all that out. Thank you for coming to our stage at this last weekend. We hadn't played in a while. So if we were a little rough, uh, I apologize. But, uh, you know, it. Uh, I thought we, we, we had a lot of fun. And it was a lot of fun seeing everybody there. So uh, thank you for attending. And maybe you could bring someone to the next show at the end of uh, this next month. Um, there you go. Right now, we're going to read the top patrons. Great. Why don't we do that? Let's do we it. We love doing that, don't we? We do. I love these patrons. Mm. Okay, Nancy. D. Leah. F. What? F. S. S. <laughs> Sarah. V. Little. Lisa. You. Kiko. Jill. E. Brian. H. Nico. P. Robert. Uh, B. Jason. W. Kristen. K. Amelia. O. Allison. L. Raj. C. Joshua. D. CJ. P. Jennifer. N. Stacy. L. Jen. P. Jen. N. Jen. Z. Nope. Jen S. I don't know. When you miss one, I go, I do 10 by myself. Fine. Jamal F. 
Janelle B, Roger S, Mike E, Eldon Supremo, 99 more, Amira, Santiago M, Chad. D. No. W. Chad W. You got the W. I'll okay. give you that. Leanne. P. Janine. R. Maya. P. Maddie. S. Belinda. N. Chris. Uh, D. H. And also Dave. H. Dave Hall, yeah. Spider-Man. Chase. Sheila. G. Brad. D. Ray. H. Tabitha. T. Tom. N. Liliana. A. Michelle. K. Talia. M. Betsy. D. Laura. G. L. And Chad. L. Rochelle. Nathan E. Marion. Meg. K. Trav. L. Dan. Uh, N. Yes, Big Stevie. W. Angel. You're blowing me away today. Oh. Angel M. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Rhiannon. C. Corey. I don't know. K. Super. Sam. Coleman. Coolers. Coleman G. Yeah. Dev. Nexon. Michelle A. Jeremy C. Cody R. Sebastian K. Gav. Inator. David. Uh, D. C. C. John B. Brandy D. Yev. Vor. Camille. S. Mm -hmm. The C. Correct. Joey M. Willie F. Christina E. Adelaide N. Omar I. Lena N. Eugene and Leah. Chris P. Nikki G. Corey. Patricia. Mar Maria N. Heather L. Jake B. Bobbitt. Ed A. Ed A. <laughs> Ed A. We do that every time. Ed A. <laughs> Abel F. Tony G. And Sean R. I couldn't do the uh, podcast without you, patrons. Thank you for supporting the podcast on the side. Uh, I hope you're still enjoying Patreon, and um, thanks for being my patrons. Thank you for uh, watching the show today or listening. You can listen anywhere that you get podcasts. Obviously, you're listening, but please get friends. Tell if you like the podcast, then get get your.